Great. And while we were doing that, I think Lila is also online. Is that correct? Yes, thank yes. you. Great. Welcome. And thank welcome you. to everybody. Thanks for joining the Edmonton Historical Board meeting of March 27th. So I'll start with uh, land acknowledgement. The Edmonton Historical Board acknowledges the traditional land on which we reside is in Treaty 6 territory. We would like to thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Neowak, the Dene, the Anishinaabe, the Iska Nakoda, the Nitsitapi, and the Métis Region 4 peoples. We acknowledge, we acknowledge this as the home of one of the largest communities of Inuit, south of the 60th parallel. It is a welcoming place and a gathering place for all peoples who come from around the world to share Edmonton as a home. And now we will look for an appro uh, approval of the agenda, just to make sure that we've got everything on it. Do I see an approval? Or actually, one thing I want to add to the agenda to just make sure we're going to talk about is in the president's report, we'll have Harrison just report on the two meetings that he attended. So I'm not sure if it's on here, but during the president's, uh, or sorry, the, the chair's report. I get mixed up between this and the other group that I'm in. So sorry about that. Uh, now we'll look at, the consent agenda, which is the minutes from the February 28th, 24th meeting. And we have approval of the consent agenda. Do I see any hands? Oh, John's given us approval. Do we have anybody that does not approve? Then the consent agenda is approved move on to the reports and first report is mine and i don't have a lot other than to say thanks to harrison to uh, for attending the two meetings uh i think that was on the fifth and the sixth of the month of march so harrison can you give a quick update on those two meetings yeah so yeah. They're pretty, pretty easy uh there was only there was no questions about the shortlisting for new members for the board. The only questions came up, well, I guess there was only really one question came up uh, when our annual report was presented on the 5th. It was just about potential, uh, you know, kind of expected, you know, potential merger talk about EHB and EHC. So they just kind of asked, you know, thoughts on that. I said, oh, there's like, you know, places where we can collaborate, you know, shared interests, blah, blah, blah. It's nothing that we, you know, fully support right now. And I think it needed to, you know, we needed to be investigated more uh so that was kind of the only thing i think counselor principally asked that question uh and that was kind of it basically for questions like no nothing nothing came up from that report that garnered any discussion so relatively easy um just had to give a bit of a spiel on both days and yeah all good good to hear well anyway thanks for doing that and uh, I do appreciate that. So sorry that I couldn't be here. Uh, we'll move on to the Heritage Unit Report. And I believe that is Sydney that's going to be doing that. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, I'm just going to, sorry, I should have done this before. My computer doesn't like, um, it's very warm. So I'm just placing it up on a stand so it, uh, doesn't melt onto my uh, onto my desk. Anyways, maybe it's a more flattering view of me as well. I don't know. Um, so uh, yeah, David is off this week. Uh, lucky duck. So I'll do my best to fill in for him. Um, I'll just go through the report that he had attached and um, provide you know some additional info. And then if people have questions afterward. Um, they can, they can, you know, they can come at me. <laughs> so uh, the big uh, designation news is that the field log house notice of intention was sent out um, at the end of February. And so we are 
preparing the bylaw for that, and it is um, set to go before city council in May. Um, well, it'll be before executive committee May 23rd, and then city council on June 11th. And their grant is about $45,500. Um, I've also been uh, communicating with the owners of the Crawford residence in Westmount, and they're quite close to finalizing all of their quotes. Um, and I've already started drafting uh, that notice of intention to designate. So we're hoping to send that out sometime in April. Um, we were taking a look at the calendar, council, the council meeting calendar earlier today, and I have a feeling this will probably go towards, go to council around August, just um, because of the 120 day period and with their uh, recess. Um, David's been chatting with the owners of the McClory residence in Glenora. Um, they've been collecting quotes for their uh, possible designation as well. I think um, a lot of our grant would go towards window restoration on that one. Um, as for all of the others on this list, like conversations continue. There haven't been any um, huge steps. I would say the biggest one are the field log house and the, the Crawford residence. Um, there are also um, some really interesting ongoing discussions about um, adding a few buildings to the inventory, uh, including the Captain John Hall residence and also Alexander Circle. Um, I'll just, I'll make a quick note that the Alexander Circle one is related to uh, the executive committee meeting that occurred on March 19th. Um, but maybe I'll just get Lila to talk about the Captain John Hall residence quickly if you're okay with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're working on designating the Captain John Hall residence. It's already on our inventory. Um, so at the moment, we're just working on drafting the notice of intention package to send out to council. Um, we haven't had picked a date for it or anything yet. So yeah, that's exciting. It's currently city owned. It's um, with the right sizing group, they're looking at selling it. And so we've been talking with them and uh, they're in agreement that we should um, designate it. The conversations were around designating it now or um, making it a condition of sale. And um, we've decided that uh, we can move forward with the designation process now. So um, that's, that's exciting. I was trying to get more, more buildings onto that list. Um, in terms of demolitions, um, unfortunately, there have been a, quite a few as of late. Um, the, let's see, the Kirkness residence, um, that demo permit was approved a few months ago. Um, there are a couple of other homes in West Jasper Place that are in the process, I think one has been approved and the other one is in the process of uh, getting their documentation together. Um, just for people who might not know, there's just some additional historic information that owners of his inventory resources need to provide um, when they want to demolish it. Um, a lot of it is like photos, historical info, real estate information, um, scaled elevation drawings. Um, so some people get those to us really quick. Some folks take a little bit longer, but um, we have recently sent out a memo for the Fred Johnson residence, which is in Garneau, um, and that one I think is going ahead. So it's um, it's we I would say we have noticed an inc like anecdotally an increase in um, interest in demolition um, in 2024. So uh, we're just you know working with people as they come through the door to talk about alternatives and you know work with them however we can. Um, in terms of current unit initiatives, I want to say I did not write the number one about my uh, role <laughs> acceptance in a permanent position. It makes it sound like I am keeping praise upon myself, but I, I'm very happy to, uh, yeah, have accepted a permanent position with the Heritage team. So you, uh, this isn't the last of me. Um, <laughs> the uh, kind of one of the bigger things that uh, has happened recently uh, in our office is that um, we were 
appearing before executive committee last week to talk about a potential new uh, heritage strategy. Um, and Eric, feel free to pop in if I, you know, to add any details you might want to. Um, so there's a motion, there were two motions made by Councillor Knack back in, I think, November, and that was what this was responding to. So one concerned the Glenora DC1 project that's been paused since 2021, and the other one was um, sort of scoping out um, a new management strategy and what we could do with that. So uh, we presented a report with a that proposed like a scaled down strategy that would um, use money from the heritage reserve to hire a consultant and um, hire a project manager with the city to work on this um, strategy that would, um, you know, potentially have some impact on uh, our granting program, which is, you know, it's a little bit unforeseen, I guess, what that impact might be, but it's definitely a consideration. So um, there were a few speakers at executive committee um, from the Old Glenora Conservation Association and Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Knack. Was it Councillor Knack also had questions? Um, so there was quite a bit of discussion um, about it at the meeting. They ended up passing two motions. Um, one was about, uh, I guess, continuing this uh, strategy um, with the reserve funds. And the other one was around uh, looking at designating Alexander Circle, which is a lovely little park in Glenora. Um, and I maybe Eric can kind of pitch in on how that came about. It felt like sort of just happened on the spot. Uh, it was a, a brilliant idea that Ann Stevenson really liked, so. Yeah. No. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah, I'll just say we, we are really excited by the idea of preparing an updated strategy for heritage for, for the city. The, there's been a lot of change in the policy context in terms of the city now having the city plan and, and you know, getting getting um, more serious about densification and so forth and the new zoning bylaw. Those have ramifications for heritage and it's uh, we're really delighted to to be the next ones in to say, hey, don't forget about heritage in the midst of all of all those other things that are going on in the city. So that's uh, and, th and then the heritage strategy will be able to to really, you know, um, address issues like climate change and truth and reconciliation and diversity inclusion and that kind of stuff. So um, it's going to be great. And um, uh, the this the, the the total just because Sydney brought up the reserve, the the total cost will be less that like the, our maximum grant amount for a, for a non-residential building for a heritage designation is five hundred thousand dollars. And and so we this is going to be less than that. We've like uh, we we said to to urban planning committee a maximum of four hundred ninety thousand dollars. And if uh, we we think that there are maybe some ways to reduce that amount as well. And so for the price of one boardwalk building designation, if you want to think of it that way, we'll be able to to come up with a fresh new strategy that will hopefully help council and the general public better appreciate the importance of of uh, place-based heritage and hopefully um, support it to a greater degree than, than we've seen in recent years. And then, yeah, Alexander Circle, um, the, yeah, there were a couple of Glenora residents who were concerned that there was a Glenora zoning project that Urban Planning Committee put on hold in 2021. Um, and uh, some, some Glenora residents who wanted to see that resume, and that's just not the way the, the sort of relatively restrictive zoning um, even if it's to you know for character purposes sort of goes against the grain and so so the politicians aren't really interested in that um, and so they were trying again to get it started and there wasn't an appetite but uh, I talked about the uh, I just mentioned um, Alexander Circle being something that you know it's a, it's a city-owned piece of land that is that is distinctive from a subdivision and and uh, uh, urban planning you know urban design perspective and Councillor Stevenson said, "Would you like some direction? Um, you know, to 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 look at actually designating that." And I said, "That would be delightful." So we got a motion. So, just for for context, I think some of you know that we like we we designated as municipal historic resources buildings, lots of buildings, and uh, at, at least two bridges. I think just two bridges, but um, our legislation allows us to designate things like parks 
and um, and natural areas and other things that we believe have like uh, historical significance. And so, so the, um, David has been working with the with the Windsor Park residents on adding Windsor Park to to our inventory, and this would be akin to that, except we we've, we've got some council direction to to move on it essentially. So that'll be hopefully give the Glenora resident something a little bit more positive to focus on. And ideally, um, yeah, I should just, I'm going off on a rant here, not a rant, but um, going off on an angle here. Um, the, some of the, the, the Glenora residents who spoke at, at Urban Planning Committee talked about how heritage designation wasn't a good tool. And, um, you know, they, they just expressed some concern about property values and understand that concern we think it's like it's actually the best tool to preserve existing historic resources is to le legally protect them and so if the city sets the example by de designating a piece of property that we own alexander circle then maybe that would help break down some of the inhibitions that some of the property owners have about their private properties i'll stop there thanks um we, yeah, I guess I'll continue on our uh, report. We've been working on uh, conducting site visits of heritage resources that were designated, you know, quite a few years ago and that we've maybe lost touch with. Um, so we started this initiative last year. Last year we did, I think, seven or eight, maybe even nine site visits. Um, and we've got a short list of seven. We haven't actually, um, sent letters to the owners yet we're gonna wait another month or so just so we can do these site visits um you know while while it's nice outside so if you if you run into anybody who um own or occupy any of these seven um they may be alarmed if you say so i heard you have a site visit coming up um we haven't quite we haven't quite reached out to them yet um but I, uh, when I returned to the city last summer, I did a few and I thought it was a really great, just a great kind of experience and way to touch base with the stewards of the historic resources um, in our city and remind them of our grant and how it can help and just to establish, uh, you know, that line of communication. And a lot of them are kept in great shape. Um, we just, you know, haven't really chatted with them in several years. Um, we have also been continuing work with our IT partners just to uh, tidy up our open data and the uh, and the map that is on the City of Edmonton webpage. Um, this is something too I want to note that like I think you know I think it's easy to read because I look at it multiple times a week. But if any of you ever have any feedback or questions or comments about it, um, please give us an email because it's always good to kind of have sort of outside input on it. Um, the rest of these updates, I think, have, we might have ch discussed them in previous meetings. Um, Strathcona Public Market, we're still in talks with, um, we're still discussing with the right sizing group, and we've had a few meetings with the province about it. Um, Eric, feel free to pop in again. I don't I think there's been a lot of movement on that in the past few weeks. And we did send the letter on that one, right? Yes. Um, I I personally haven't seen any responses, but they might have just responded to you directly, Steve. If... Yeah, no, I've, I've not seen a response to that one. Yeah, other ones that we have written, and Stevenson has actually uh, written to me at least. I don't know if she's CCing uh Catherine or not or anybody else but on this one i've not seen anything so okay okay thanks for the, the only update. the only thing i heard back from like about mm, five or seven days after i sent the e letter on behalf of the historical board was um just um receipt that they'd received it and that's every, everything i'd got so okay good to know um the modern inventory that we've been working on a project harder for has been kind of paused for now just because of this um, heritage strategy that is a bit of a bigger concern. So um, I think we're going to kind of put that on the back burner for a few months while we figure out this kind of more pressing project. Uh, the Corman block, 
um, is still owned by the city and uh, there are still ongoing dis discussions about um, you know how to sell it and how to preserve it or at least parts of it so you know if anybody knows of anyone who's interested in buying an old old building and um, fixing the hole in the roof and maybe making it into affordable housing send them send them to Harrison I guess <laughs> um, send them to Harrison's team but uh, we uh, yeah I was in a meeting recently talking about potentially rezoning it because it's currently zoned uh, a very specific direct control zone that was uh, for a project that is no longer happening there. So it needs to change to either a standard zone or um, a, a different DC1 zone. So I think right now they're looking at making it a standard zone, which can throw the heritage safety of it, I guess, a little bit. Um, I don't want to say it jeopardizes it, but it's it's a concern. Um, but an argument, a compelling argument, was made that as long as the city owns it, it's not going to be demolished. It's going to be, it's basically still protected as long as it's with the city. And then future discussions with a possible buyer can happen about heritage protection from there. So, um, yeah, that is also another ongoing project. I would say, yeah, everything else on this list um, it's a very similar to what it was last month. Uh, work is ongoing. One uh, good piece of news that I can share uh, about Point 16, the Mill Creek Trestle Bridge, is that we've been told that they are going to go with option three, which is to retain the bridge. Um, there was a Bit of a possibility that they might try to demolish it and uh, David especially worked really hard to uh, you know make make not make IIS but you know to communicate the importance of the bridge the importance of the bridge to the community the political risk uh, associated with trying to de-designate and demolish it and eventually they uh, came to an agreement so bridge is saved for now <laughs> Um, I think I can wrap up my report. Um, if anybody, Eric or Lila, has anything else to add? Just, just one, one late breaking one that probably didn't make it onto the the written report is just relates to the University Grocery Building, which is in Strathcona. Um, it's a it's a well known like historic corner store that had a significant fire recently, and. Uh, we have been in contact with the property owner who wants to demolish it and uh, do something different. So just um, just so you know, that's another one that's... Sydney was trying to leave us on a good note and that's that's one that it sounds like is not gonna be uh, probably saved. Where is it? It is on 85th Ave and 107th Street. It's, um, it's kind of an outlier. It's a white uh, wood clad, building it was it, it was historically a grocery store i think it has apartment units on top it's been a uh like an antique shop for several years um i think i think when i was in university the edmonton bicycle commuters were in it if i remember correctly well that's neat so it's yeah. kind of the one commercial building in um a block of residential buildings um, so it yeah unfortunately there was a i think a substantial fire there a few months ago and i uh talked with the owner and they mentioned that there was an, an additional fire after that um i think some people got in and you know set another fire inside so um i didn't i wasn't able to get sort of a a really detailed assessment on the building condition but it sounds like it's in rough shape so Any questions for Sydney or Eric? Martin, go ahead. I just had one question. You'd mentioned the, there was a city property, I can't remember the name, that was going to, going to go ahead with a designation, with, but the plan was to sell it. And I, I just was wondering, for my information, how that strategy works, because I, I guess the city designating means they don't directly get funds at this point for doing any renovation. And then the 
someone buys it understanding the condition so i affect it, i suppose it affects the price of it if it's designated but is that right because there's a couple in my neighborhood i know which were of, of houses that are designated and then they've been selling on for sale for some years but the city did had to do quite a lot of work on foundations and stuff i guess to make them sellable so is this a strategy that is better than what they've um, done before i think we i know which two houses you're talking about john um and it would be yeah sort of a similar situation um what we've sort of the agreement we've come to with um are you, i think you're talking about the two oliver houses yeah so those ones as uh i guess part of the sales agreement whoever buys those will be able to access our funding um so even though they were designated back in i think 2007 uh, no funding, no heritage funding has gone towards them because they were city owned. And we understand that you kind of have to provide some incentives if people are going to want to take on quite a large project of restoring that building. Uh, so it would be the same for the Captain John Hall residence. Uh, the Captain John Hall residence is in Cromville. It's like right on the corner uh, at the end of Jasper Avenue. Um, so we would probably have a similar agreement where the city wouldn't use any, obviously we can't use any heritage funding to restore it, but we would make that funding available to a future owner. And I think the John Hall residence is in better shape than the Oliver houses. And it's got probably the most beautiful River Valley view in the city, or at least are, you know, one of the best and yeah. so, so we, we can see it being attractive to a, to a I, I believe park. that i in any time i've been there in that park i mean it's named viewpoint for a reason so then the house looks i agree much better condition than the outside so that's good to hear i just want yeah. to understand that thanks we'd still have to sort of figure out um there's a few different moving parts um we'd have to work with parks and open space and subdivision to because it's actually part of a huge piece of parkland so we'd have to subdivide it into its own housing lot but um, these are all things that i guess real estate are experts in so we'd kind of work with them and work with our other upe colleagues on uh, that whole process james, james? <laughs> hey city just uh, i've got two quick questions here one on um just on that uh, john hall comment do you have a timeline as to when you anticipate that property actually going to the public market in light of all those kind of issues? Um, maybe I'll get Eric to answer this. I thought it was a few years, but um, I might be a little off there. Sure, sure, yeah, James. The situation is that when the, the city did a master plan for Dawson Park and Canard Ravine a few years ago, and you can find that online and you'll see a page that talks about this house and how it could be used as a essentially a park pavilion or sort of for parks purposes and so that's what our parks planner colleagues got interested and excited about and then our real estate colleagues just are dealing with a with a very significant um, bill of deferred maintenance on a lot of city-owned properties and so they're looking at uh, do we really need this and so forth and do the parks planners have the money to actually make that happen which they don't and so um so yeah so basically a different a different idea has come forward um so this is it, it, it it's as, as sydney said the fact that the captain john hall residence is on a large parks property which is in the river valley like we have a you know we have a river valley bylaw and um and and so there's there's just extra complexities in terms of subdividing like if it was on a if it was in the middle of um alberta avenue or something it could just like we could subdivide the lot relatively sim simply but th there's an environmental implications and so forth and so um so we just decided so as a as a as a team and after talking with our real estate colleagues and our parks planner colleagues who have slightly different perspectives everyone agrees on the fact that it should be protected and so like let's get that protection in and then and then we'll see what happens like if 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 the parks planners come up with some money to to do something um that that connects with their master plan great if if they don't which i think is more probable then the city will probably proceed to sell after after taking those extra steps but um protecting the building is is the key thing from our perspective something we can do while the city figures out its other moves 
Thanks, Eric. That's helpful. Um, the other question I had is um, when the demolition of the Kirkness residence was raised by uh, David Johnson previously, I just asked if, you know, there was going to be any, you know, correspondence with the province and whether the province had any, you know, indication to perhaps step in, knowing that that house is, you know, a little bit more significant than the typical house that comes forward. I'm just wondering if anything came from that or if you've heard from the province at all on that point. I said, you're on mute there. Sorry, I thought I hit on mute, but I must have missed it. Um, we did reach out to them and I, I'd have to go back on my emails to see their exact answer, but I think they kind of said it wasn't quite significant enough for them to intervene. Yeah. Um, the person who lived in there, uh, it was her father who was sort of a quite a significant historical figure, but there's no documentation of her father ever having, you know, been at the house or done anything at the house. Um, so I think because there was sort of a lack of, um, you know, that connection, um, they they decided not to intervene. So Yeah, and, and, and as you might have heard, um, when, when, when we send demolition memos to council, we usually hear nothing. In this case, we did hear from Councillor Salvador, who's the ward councillor, and she was asking David a number of questions about what we could do. And after discussing it, because we had previously had conversations with the, with the, with the fellow who's purchased it and is planning to demolish it, or, and, and it may, I haven't been by it, maybe it may be demolished already. Um, he just wasn't receptive, and and um, it just would be a very a very costly endeavor for the city to 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 try to stop it by force designating it. And so she eventually she asked a bunch of questions, you know, out of sincerity, and then just basically gave up because it was going to be, it, it wasn't going to be achievable. Where was that one? Uh, it was Ada Boulevard and seventy third seventy three oh eight. Ada Boulevard. Yeah, 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 Virginia Park neighborhood. Any further questions? If not, we'll move on. Thanks a lot. Congratulations, Sydney. We're happy that you uh, were successful as well. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, moving on to the next report, which is the naming committee, and back to Harrison. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So we had a few, uh, a couple items that were that that came back to us after we originally sent our uh, thoughts on them, and then we had three items that came to us for the first time. Uh, some new applications. So two of the old ones. Uh, the first one was the Quarry Ridge re uh, naming. Uh, the original proposal was just quarry for a neighborhood within that general area in Horse Hills, Northeast Edmonton. And we recommended it just be Quarry Ridge because that's what people kind of call it today anyway, not just quarry, because quarry is just by itself, just doesn't really mean a whole lot. And the consultants thought, yeah, that the you know, developers were fine with that. So we approved that Quarry Ridge renaming, or not, I guess just naming, because it was just, I think it was like called Horse Hills Neighborhood 2 or something like that before. And then we had a presentation actually on the renaming of Ezio Ferrone Park from some members, I guess one member, one current member of the Edmonton Police Service, and then a couple past members that were involved with the original Ezio Ferrone Park development back in, I think, like the late 80s, early 90s, kind of after he passed in 1990, they started that process. So we had some discussions about, uh, oh, they, they just kind of provided us background on the park naming process, the history of it and all that, and then just kind of what the name means to members of Edmonton Police, uh, past members, all that stuff. Because the current proposal is Ezio Ferrone Edmonton Police Memorial Park. So we let them you know, provide their thoughts and the presentation, everything like that. And then after they left, we just had an internal discussion about what we thought. Uh, we're still we're still not too sure about including the name police in there just because the, the the whole idea for the name is to kind of memorialize fallen officers not you know edmonton police in general because apparently there was already 
uh, a police memorial park or police park of some sort on the ledge grounds. Uh, that's there already. Is. Yeah, yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, so there's already an existing park near the legislature. So we were kind of thinking the name should just kind of reflect or focus on the fact that it's for fallen members of EPS and not just the police service in general. So we're still considering some naming options uh, other than Ezio Ferrone Edmonton Police Memorial Park. So that one we're going to bring back to our next meeting to kind of discuss some more and maybe even provide some naming recommendations uh, that could be accepted by by the group that put put it forward in the first place. And then we had three three new naming requests. Uh, one in the All Says neighborhood. So All Says A L C E S. I think it's like a Latin term for trees or plants, something like that. It's down in the Dakota area, southeast Edmonton, so kind of south of Ellersy Road and east of 50th Street. So it's a not there's not even any houses there yet. It's just you know being subdivided, getting ready to develop the first phase. And the name of the road is just all, all says link. Uh, just, you know your typical developer name aligns with their naming policy. Nothing crazy. Uh, we were fine with that that request. Uh, and then there is another New Burlington. I think it was in. Let me find it. Yeah, so it is actually in the same neighborhood and all says as well. Uh, they're renaming, they're going to name a park um, after a uh, significant member of this, uh, the Sikh community in Edmonton. Uh, his name is, well, he's passed away now, but his uh, the park's proposed name is uh, Bai Jagir Singh Ji Park. And he was a pretty significant member of the Sikh community in Edmonton. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of history about him, uh, how he just you know, supported the community, uh, you know, originally with the um, Sikh, the initial Sikh immigrants to Edmonton back after partition of India and Pakistan, uh, kind of helping them set roots here and all that stuff. So this was, uh, this is a community-led na naming request um, and one that we thought made sense just because also that general area of Edmonton Southeast, there's a large uh, Sikh population there. So it kind of made sense why they would want to name a park in that area after this, after this fellow. So we, uh, we're good with that request. We approved that one. And then the last one uh, was another another naming request uh, provided by the community. It's in Boyle Street. It was just a short, it's just a short section of road, uh, 101A Avenue between 96 and 97th Street. Uh, so the proposal for this one is to call it Oscar Ka Okis Okisakao Way. Um, Okisakao means angel. I think it's in the Cree language. And it's uh, just a name, it's it's a renaming of uh, that two block stretch or that one block stretch um, after a lady. Um, I think her name was, um, let me see here. So th this, this actually, this naming uh, request has been in the process since like 20, 2011, 2012. So it's been a long time coming. Uh, and it was actually put together by a working group uh, to rename the stretch Okisakao uh, Angel Way. So it was named after this uh, lady. I think she uh, was homeless for a period of time, but she was, you know, involved with supporting the community. And she, I think, she passed away uh, back, you know, in 2011 or 2010. And I think after that happened, uh, there was a kind of a more of a push to rename a street within Boyle Street because that's kind of where she, that's that was her neighborhood where she where she was. Uh, working, uh, helping community members and everything. So they decided to rename a section of road within that area after her. And the uh, Indigenous Relations Office of the city was involved in this renaming as well. Uh, okay, so the, yeah, the lady's name is Gloria uh, Nia Pitan. She was an, she's an artist, she's a street survivor and social activist. So there's a, there's a lot of documentation about why, you know, she deserves to be on a, you know, on, named after her on the street. And we thought there was a lot of support behind it from the community, just like with the other, um, the Sikh renaming. So we didn't really have any reason to not approve it. Felt, you know, it was in line with our renaming policy. Um, There's a lot of support from the community. So we went forward with that renaming as well. And yeah, it was decently long, you know, with some three new requests, those two previous uh, requests. And yeah, um, that was generally it for us. We're going to meet again end of April. And it's kind of nice because our meetings fall basically a day before each be meeting. So it's pretty easy to provide an update when it was just yesterday. So you can remember. Uh, That's good. Yeah, John, did you have a question? Yeah, John's got a question. Well, more just a comment about when you mentioned the Ezio for own naming. I'm, I'm 
I really appreciate that you're taking a serious look at this because, I mean, I look out my window at it. I see it every, in front of me every morning. And and I, about four years ago or three or four years ago, it, it actually, the connection with the police does trigger some people to do things. It was defaced with paint because of yeah. the, the, the statue. And then it, other people get very upset. So people actually came out, not officially tried to clean it, damage the statue. I mean, it was just, it is something that does trigger people to focus on the police aspect. And I think naming it that would be just one more step in that direction. I, I, I'm kind of nervous about doing that. So thanks for looking at it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's exactly what we talked about too. You know, in 2020 with all the, the, the protests and the George Floyd uh, news out of the States, that was, you know, a hot area to graffiti and all that stuff. And I think it still gets, you know, tagged and stuff. You know, once in a while still to this day so yeah something we were definitely definitely are considering with any renaming proposal is what you know the community at large is going to think about it and potentially any ramifications from that yeah thanks yeah, you're welcome uh yeah that's all i had steve thanks harrison any further questions for harrison okay we will move on to catherine and the city archivist uh the uh report so there is a link in the agenda to the written report that I've attached and, and it's in the folder if you want to review it later. I just want to highlight that the, the archivists are working incredibly hard, uh, focusing mostly on the community um, collections where um, with a little bit of diversity, we haven't had a lot of uh, that material up on the catalog yet, but we now do have a large amount of material and there's new material coming in because we have a dedicated archivist working on cultural communities and communities of interest. Um, HIV is about to go live. Um, so it, it forms the last major collection in our gay and lesbian archives and other adjacent archives here at the city. So um, we've been working really intensively with um, a, a, a committee. So that, that work is um, until new collections come in, that work is essentially done for that community right now. Um, and this HIV collection is huge. Um, the, um, there is also, because some of the smaller commu uh, the community, the cultural communities coming in don't really have a sense of archives. They're not giving us a lot of materials. So we have a number of small bits and pieces now that we hope we will be able to grow into particular full. But in the meantime, we've collected them into what we're calling the Community Archives Collection. And there's a link there so you can see the descriptions and the kind of things that are in that. So we at least have some representative material. And there's a great deal right now because we've been working with the Chinese community. But because they have some of their own archives, they're not necessarily donating to us yet. Um, but that that's there. Um, and the other big collection that, that's been done is um, the law department. Um, we've done a lot of the the um, city's side of the Kate, course Kate court cases that specifically um, dealt with mayors and councillors who were got in trouble with the law. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, that material's in the link uh, to the legal documents uh, link in the in my report. Um, Instagram, our Instagram record, um, account has been very active, and there's some fun things coming up. So I've put a link to the recent post there if you're interested in being or if you're already on instagram so you can get in with that um, the pop-up exhibits are ongoing and we've been in touch with several communities um, and we are actually also going to launch a couple of our exhibits at the conduct days exhibit if you go to conduct days um, there's a memory area in one of the buildings and so we're going to have a couple of exhibits maybe three uh, mostly around sports at that one and then we'll start circulating those as new pop-ups that will go around the community after that um, and then just to let you know the recruitment for the historian laureate is going forward next week and elizabeth's going to help us out as our representative and councillor stevenson also will be on the panel and i'm attempting to get a third member from the uh heritage council but david's been away so i haven't had that uh response yet but hopefully we'll have somebody from the heritage council there as well and we have three very good candidates and i'm very hopeful we'll have an excellent eighth historian laureate in the next little while that's exciting uh mitchell did you put up your hand or oh yes yeah, sorry belay that complete accident <laughs> okay, no problem. any questions for catherine Okay, we will carry on. Thanks, Catherine. 
Uh, we will move on to the committee reports and that we'll start with the historic resources review panel. There was no meeting, but James, I will ask you if you've got anything anyway. No, thanks, Steve. Yeah, nothing to report at this time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Policy and Planning Committee, Elise. Uh, yeah, not too much to report. Uh, we chatted about um, council deciding not to get rid of EHC due to community support, which is great. Uh, and then we talked about writing kind of a a thank you letter, <laughs> I guess, just to good faith to say like, hey, thanks for listening to the community. Um, so I'm going to work on that and then, uh, yeah, circle it around the committee and then we'll let you guys take a look too. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of what we chatted about at our last me meeting. Thank you, Elise. Any yeah. questions? I don't see any, so we will carry on. Thanks, Elise, and move on to the Historic Plaques Committee and Elizabeth. We met on March 6th. Um, however, uh, it, it was more of a working meeting. Uh, so uh we discussed uh kind of the plaques that are coming in and mitchell created a document with the owner responses so that we could keep track of everything um and then uh mitchell also presented the 2024 2025 timeline for the plaque process which uh was approved um uh, and then we uh talked about uh the upcoming event and saint luke's anglican church has agreed to host us so yay um and we're getting everything in place uh for the um open doors event um and we also discussed the website uh with some of the ideas and feedback on how to improve it so it was a nice productive meeting so do you need any more feedback from us on the website? Um, I think Catherine would know better. If you have some, I, ha I we started to um, merge all the things into a document and which we'll send to the um, webmaster in the next little while. Um, so if you still have comments, you can send them to me over the next week, but I wanna sort of, after Easter, I'll be back in touch and hope to get David started on uh, on revamping some of the, the based on the, some of the comments received. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for the work on that. That's to me so, so important. So, and on our day, it's what's the date, Elizabeth, for the plaque presentation? The tenth of January, uh, July. Tenth of July. It's okay. the, it's the Wednesday night. Okay. Thank you. So everyone mark your calendars for that. So how many people will that venue hold? Will it hold more than what we had at the- uh... It's a church hall. It'll probably hold 300. Okay. So <laughs> I don't think you're gonna get that, but no. go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we have put the, uh, we've requested the ad be put into the program as well as on the website this year. So we may get a few more than we had last year. So that'd be great. Social media as well. Yeah. Yeah, didn't didn't you do a kind of unofficial, illegal, some sort of uh, social media thing, Elizabeth? Yeah, yeah, and we got a house designated out of it, so no regrets. <laughs> Perfect. No, I either do I good job. That was I thought it was fantastic. So very very good. Uh, Steve, uh, quick question yeah. on that point. Um, Sure. Just, is there any possibility of us getting that posted on the city's website? I know that's challenging to get it, get things listed on the city's actual website. David Johnson spoke of that, you know, a couple of years back. I'm just wondering if that attitude has shifted or if that's still, you know, almost I could impossible. Probably get something on the city's Twitter feed. I just need to give them more um, notice. So we'll put that on, on Mitchell's uh 
to-do list sort of in mid-June. Um, and then in terms of, we can put it on our web page uh, and on the historic, uh, Edmonton Historic Board um, website as well. But are you thinking on the front page of edmonton.ca? Uh, that would be ideal, but any of the high traffic ones obviously would be good too. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Are you saying we're not a high traffic search on the Edmonton <laughs> website there, James? No comment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just, uh, one of the pop-ups actually got put on the front page and our, our, um, our response rate, our click rate in the first week is three times higher than our regular click rate on our page back in the back of edmonton.ca. So it does make a difference if you hit the front page. I agree. Yeah, for sure. Any questions or any further questions for Elizabeth? Okay, we will carry on. There was no engagement committee meeting so I don't think we have anything there, but an administrative support. This is your time to shine, Mitchell. Do you have anything? Um, nope. Um, Catherine already touched on that the um, Councillor Stevenson and Elizabeth will be very kindly assisting us um, April, this upcoming Tuesday, April 2nd, to help the historian laureates um how many, is this actual interviews that you do yes so they'll be conducted virtually in the evening um each each applicant will get a half hour to talk about what it is they would like to bring to the table what it is like a kind of a certain population of segment of the population they might like to highlight and discuss further um and methods that they would like to do that whether it be like pursuing book pursuing more material to present in a book that they can distribute or being able to have more interactive museum displays, ex exhibitions, things like that. So like Catherine already mentioned, we have three very good, um, very fun sounding applicants. Um, and I'm very looking forward to seeing who Elizabeth Ann and someone else from the Edmonton Heritage Council choose for us. Yeah, that sounds exciting. That'll be nice. Oh, yeah. Okay, we will move on. We're very much ahead of the game here. Uh, I'll just give anybody uh, a chance to put up their hand if they have anything to add to the meeting. And I see, or I heard a hand. Where was it? It was me. Oh, Harrison. Harrison. Go ahead. I, was say, I, like, I like Rachel's background. is very distinguished. Full books and plants and a neat little clock at the top. So yeah, I like the clock. Thank you. I'll have you know this is not a Zoom background. It's all real. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, because you see that sometimes they have like the green screen fake one. And it's like, no, that's those are real books. You can open it up and read them. I was going <laughs> to say you have to take out a book. Oh. <laughs> yeah, proof. There we go. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. That's impressive. <laughs> thank you. Not Thanks. a single, I have not a single bit of IKEA in this household, I'm proud to say. Wow. That's <laughs> very nice. Yeah. And I've got a question for you, though, Mitchell. Do you, are you enjoying your job, your new job? Oh, very much so. Yeah. No, um, Catherine is very has a very good sense of humor, which really helps the work go by. Um, and then, like, yeah, no, I'm very much being able to engage with all the like all the minutia that the job requires, the different boards that I'm able to attend and take minutes for, and. I'm a very organized individual, so I get a good deal of satisfaction scheduling meeting minutes and taking agendas and all that. So, yeah, it's going great. Well, we appreciate you, so thanks. Thank you. And uh, our next meeting is April 24th. And do I have somebody to a uh, motion for adjournment? Harrison, yeah. I don't think anybody will uh, be against that. So thanks a lot, everybody. It's right at six o'clock. So. Good. Thanks, people. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.